Section 7 of Ancient Ideals in Modern Life, Four Lectures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Ideals in Modern Life, Four Lectures by Annie Besant. The Caste System, Part 2. Supposing one of the possible reforms to be that we put forward this idea of preserving the fourfold order, but gradually abolishing the numerous subdivisions, might it not be possible to win the educated opinion of India to that idea, and so gradually to restore some vitality to this system? Might it not be possible that these innumerable subdivisions should be gradually abolished, without shaking the foundation of the fourfold order which Sri Krishna declared to be established by himself? Then a question is continually raised. Can there not be transition from caste to caste? I cannot but ask you in answer, where would the authority be found which would be capable of guiding such a transition and would be recognized by all as truly authoritative? Frankly speaking, I do not believe that it is practicable until a great authority, a true spiritual authority, is once more manifested and recognized through India, which will speak with the divine voice and be able to give the recognition which is based on knowledge. You may remember that in the famous case of Vishvamitra before mentioned, it was not a recognition from those around him that he sought, but a recognition from the gods themselves and from no lower authority. It was only when they proclaimed him a Brahmarshi that the transition was recognized, and only true spiritual knowledge would be able to decide on such a point. Rather would I suggest the old and wise way of looking at this matter, that whatever be the body one is born with, one should cheerfully, accepting the karma of that body, work in that body with all its advantages and disadvantages, whatever they may be. If a bad body be what is obtained by one's karma, then one should cheerfully pay the karmic debt and hope for a better body in the future. If the soul has taken a lower body than that to which his qualities entitle him, then it is proper to apply to such a case the theory that the soul has made the sacrifice for the sake of rendering some service to humanity. And having made the sacrifice, why should he grudge the payment of that sacrifice, and why should he not accept the karma of that body, and willingly take upon himself all the disadvantages it may entail? If we were more spiritual in our vision, and not so limited by the illusion of the body, we should not lay so much stress on these bodily distinctions, but should cheerfully accept the working of the law, and follow where the law may lead. Now we come to another fundamental point one of the most practical we can consider. In the old days there was a definite discipline in each caste. How was that discipline exercised? In the old days, outcasting was the instrument of discipline. What were the causes of which outcasting was the effect? This was necessary, as we've seen, in order to maintain the purity of the caste. Where the qualities of the caste were not shown, there the man was outcast and was not allowed to injure the family heredity by passing on the type of a body polluted by his evil qualities. There is still that old machinery, there is still that old name of outcasting, but the question arises today, by whom is that authority used? On whom is that authority exercised? Those who wield the authority of caste are by no means in the present day, for the most part, the true leaders of the caste in learning, in wisdom, in purity, in the respect of their fellows. I speak what many of you know to be the fact, that over and over again, when decision is given in one of these caste subdivisions, that decision is brought about by those who are by no means the worthiest members of that caste. It is largely a matter of intrigue and private interest, a matter of active exertion by some who have personal motives behind the work that they are doing. This is a well-known fact, and too often the decision of a caste is swayed by men who by outer formality of religion gain an outer respect, not warranted by purity of life, by learning, by wisdom, and nobility of character. You know further, as well as I do, that when you come to deal with outcasting as now practiced, it is not only that the people who practically control the decision are those who ought not to do it, but also that they exercise their authority over those over whom that authority should not be exercised. You know perfectly well that within the limits of a caste, a man may outrage every principle of morality, and yet no man will think of outcasting him. In life he may practically disregard all the caste principles, but if he keeps an outward show, he's not outcasted. 
That man may go to a hotel, may eat beef, may get drunk, but provided he goes in by the back door and not by the front door, his caste men will shut their eyes to his errors. Whereas if a man travels out of India, however well educated he may be, however pure the life he may lead, however useful he may be to his community, you will find that in some subdivisions of a caste he is outcasted for the mere fact of travelling. How can a system last where such injustice is done? If a young man leaves his country and goes abroad, when he returns, it is a mere question of chance whether he should be outcasted or not. Some men, when they have come back, have again been received by their caste men, while others have not been. I do not wish to mention any names, but I could quote name after name of men who have travelled abroad, and are known to have so travelled, and who have been received by their own caste with welcome on their return. And I could also go to a long number of names of those who have been treated in exactly the opposite way, who have been outcasted on their return, although no challenge has been made against their morality, except that they have crossed the black water. Sometimes a Vaishya goes abroad, comes back, and is welcomed in his caste, while in another case a Vaishya goes and is outcasted on his return. Only the other day in Calcutta, a shraddha was performed, in which five hundred orthodox brahmanas were present, and yet it was the shraddha of the father of a man who had taken a degree in Europe, while there are many who, for the same reason, have been outcasted and shut away from all sacred rites. I know of two brahmanas of southern India, one of whom was taken back into caste, and the other outcasted. You must distinguish here between the question of travelling and the question of the result of European life on some of those who go, a result arising out of the evil conditions under which they live in Europe. That is quite a different matter and should not be dealt with under this head. I will speak of that presently. Let me speak to you for a moment on this question of travelling itself, which is moving young India more and more. You know that in the army recruiting goes on largely among Brahmanas. Now every soldier has to take the oath to serve abroad, as well as here, but no one dreams of outcasting soldiers when they return from foreign service, though the same Brahmanas would be outcasted if they travelled abroad as civilians. There is no rational basis, no recognised standard, no real judgment in such matters. Is it not true that according to the ignorance of the subcaste is the cruelty of its outcasting? The less the subcaste is educated, the more bigoted is it with regard to this particular question. In the old days, Indians were not tied down within the limits of India. Indians went freely out from India and travelled in the different countries of the world. You find stories of shipwreck, curious incidents in foreign lands, showing that in those days Indians travelled freely in all directions, and no man dreamed of making the fact of travelling an accusation against his fellow Hindu. Not only was that the case in the past, it is the case to a considerable extent even in the present, in some subcasts. A large number of Vaishyas are travelling through Persia, following out their business on matters of commerce. Large numbers of southern Indians of all castes are travelling to and living in Burma at the present time, and are forming there a definite Hindu community where all ordinary Hindu customs are observed and marriages are carried out. You find both in the past and in the present that Hindus travelled into foreign parts, and no man injured them because of it. But this is not the only thing to consider. I ask you whether in modern times is it not clearly a part of the advancing march of the world that nations should mingle with nations and learn to know each other better than they have done? Can you not see on all sides that nations are being drawn together, that walls of separation are being broken down, that they are learning to know each other, to understand each other, and so preparing to live together more peacefully than in the past? Over and over again war breaks out through misunderstanding, where nations are separated from nations, they suspect each other, they mistrust each other, they hate each other, until such suspicion, mistrust and hatred break out into international conflict. When nations know each other better, they learn to love and trust each other more. All the nations of the world are beginning to mingle with each other. Why should India alone be excluded from this great family of nations, and be shut up within her own limits, within her own borders, instead of sharing with others all the advantages that different nations possess? This question of travelling is one of greater importance at the present time than perhaps you may think. The mind is enlarged, the character grows wider and nobler by travel. How can you know the great forward movement of the world if you're entirely shut out from it? The world is moving, whether you move or not. Other nations are growing, whether you grow or not. 
You may turn your back on them, but they will go on, growing all the same, and the danger is that they are assimilating Indian thought. They are assimilating Indian philosophy and are beginning to share something of the spirituality of Indian religion. They are getting from you all they want, and you are getting nothing in return, because you shut yourselves in. Do you know that your ideas of the outer world are exceedingly erroneous and exceedingly mistaken? Over and over again among educated and thoughtful men I find most absurd ideas of foreign nations and suspicions that have no basis in reality. We cannot have brotherhood until we learn to know each other and learn to love each other. And shall India be excluded from the human brotherhood and be marked off by selfish isolation in the centuries to come? No, I do not believe that this is possible. But a definite change in this respect should be made by the thoughtful and this tyranny of outcasting for travel should be thrown off. It is fair to say that the prejudice against foreign travel has a real foundation in the results that it too often has upon those who go under the present conditions. I admit, as far as the most orthodox Hindu admits, that the effect of Western travel on many young men is deplorable to the very last extent. But that is not because of the travel, it's because of the conditions with which that travel is surrounded. When your young sons go abroad, when they are thrown into foreign society without any elders to take care of them, finding everything around them different from what they left at home, having no public opinion to control them, no family love to hold them, thrown into utterly new conditions, what wonder is it that they break down morally, that they become deteriorated and pick up the worst and not the best of European civilization? I know from experience that these young men coming to London go into the very worst conditions that London has to offer for young men of gentle birth. Crowded into lodging houses kept by people who are of fifth or sixth grade in society, of the status of small shopkeepers and nothing more, they find in them all that they see of English society and English social life. They do not mingle with the cultivated classes. They do not mingle with the better type of Englishmen and English women. They go to London as strangers with none to help and guide them. They are not to be blamed, but rather they are to be pitied, that they often pick up European vices and very rarely assimilate European virtues, that they come back with the manners of the stable and the kitchen. That state of things is to be corrected. If residence in Europe is to be made useful, they must not go as they go today. They must go into conditions carefully made for them, where the influence should be moral, where the training should be religious, and where the atmosphere should be refined. And then... They will no longer come back, as too often they come back now, having lost Hindu virtues and acquired European vices. On the contrary, they will maintain their Hindu virtues and add to them useful European qualities, and thus the prejudice against travel will disappear and you will reap its useful characteristics instead of the mischiefs that are found today. There is another point, then, that I ask you carefully to consider. Will you introduce into the caste system uniformity of practice? Will you introduce the recognition of merits and demerits, instead of being swayed by prejudice and ignorance? Will you outcast for profligacy, for dishonouring the dharma of the caste? If that were done, outcasting would still have a useful part to play, whereas, as used today, it is an instrument too often of social tyranny, of petty persecution and not of religion, and it does not really guard the purity of the castes. If it is seen that this change should be brought about, then practical steps should be taken to bring it about. Thoughtful, educated, and religious Hindus should mark outlines of action, and then deliberately walk along them and stand by them, whatever it may cost. They should try to prevent outcasting for travel, and if it be done, they should ignore it and behave as if it had not occurred. The men who are leaders in such changes must themselves be models, spotless in life and examples to others, in order that they may carry with them public opinion in order that they may gradually restore all that is good in the system, while eliminating all that is evil. Hypocrisy, at present rampant, must be destroyed. That which we so often find, mere pretense of penance where no remorse is felt, must utterly be done away with. A man should be looked upon as an outcast, not because he travels, but because after he travels he performs a sham of a penance, time after time, as is too often done at the present day, with no intention in future to avoid the cause of the penance. I've heard a man boast that he travels backwards and forwards constantly and pays five rupees on his return to his priest and performs prayashita and then is received without demur. 
Such prayashitas are blasphemies and dishonor all who take part in them. There's one other point which I must touch upon before leaving the subject. Outside of all castes, there are thousands and millions of men and women born in India who are utterly neglected and treated with callous indifference. I know that in these provinces this question has not the same urgency as in the South, but a common interest should be felt in the questions affecting the South of India by the people of the North, as the Southern people should feel for the questions especially affecting the North. The vast mass of the neglected pariahs in the South are at once a menace and a disgrace to Hinduism throughout the whole country. It is among them that the missionaries gain most of their converts, not from the standpoint of religion, but from the standpoint of society. For so short-sighted are the Hindus there that they will exclude from their houses pariahs even of decent life, but the same man who has thus been excluded will be received in their house when he is a convert to Christianity or to Islam. What is the result? That Hinduism is becoming undermined, and Mohammedans and Christians are increasing in the south. In the south you find the Christian converts are numbered by thousands and thousands, and when you ask about them, you hear that they are drawn mostly from the pariahs. When they are converted, they take a social step upwards. And what wonder that they take that step when they find no other way of inclusion in society open to them? Is it wise to undermine Hinduism in that fashion? And as this pariah population increases, and the relative proportion changes between it and the castes, we shall find Hinduism becoming weaker and weaker, and larger and larger masses of people growing up outside it, instead of within it. Would it not be wiser for the learned amongst you to devise some way in which it would be possible to reach these people, to teach them, to give them simple principles of religion and some moral and religious training, and to treat them with such respect as they can win by their character? Would it not be wiser to do this from within Hinduism rather than multiply other religions which are inimical to Hinduism and which undermine Hinduism and threaten its social stability? Such, then, are some of the problems that lie before you, problems certainly not so deep as those with which before we've been dealing in previous conventions, but problems that are being discussed more than ever in India and which are dividing society into those who will have no change on one side and those who demand a total abolition of caste on the other. Here lies the peril of India. This division of her people into two opposing camps, this division into two parties, one which will not move at all, the other which wants to move away from all the old ideals, from all that has made India distinctive among the nations of the world. I am trying to win you to a medium course, to one which shall cling to the old ideals, shall purify the modern actualities, shall re-establish the ancient religion and the ancient social system, instead of the mere burlesques of them, which is all we have in modern days. I know that these social changes are perhaps the most difficult of all because they're so mixed up with family traditions, with social customs, with the whole fabric of ordinary daily life, yet the question is one of life or death, one of progress or extinction. It is because of that that I have used such plain words in speaking to you of it, and that I have described some of the scandals and the evils that we see around us. You know well enough that all through India I have spoken in favor of the ancient system, the essential system of the four great castes, that I hold the restoration of that system to be vital to the welfare of India, that I believe it to be the best system that was ever organized that the evolution of the soul can go on within it better than in any other. Just because I hold it so valuable, just because I believe it to be so vital, I desire to preserve it in India. But I tell you, it cannot be preserved much longer under the present conditions, and that it is already tottering to its fall, owing to the justifiable attacks that are assailing it from all sides. Among the educated classes it is becoming more and more disapproved. Continually among thoughtful men we find a growing rebellion, a growing revolt against that which cannot be justified either by religion or by reason. And just because it is valuable, let us try to preserve it. Do not let abuses destroy it. Do not let the most ignorant be the most powerful and rule the caste. Let the educated take the question into their own hands. Let the learned decide and not the ignorant multitude. It is for the learned to lead and it is for the ignorant to follow. Wisdom is the only true basis of authority. By right thinking and right reason must the caste system be reformed, if it is to be reformed at all. 
the educated and pure living members of a caste are seriously in fault when they stand idly aside and allow the authority of their caste to be wielded unfairly cruelly and inappropriately here as in so many cases the lethargy and want of public spirit of the educated indian are to blame inasmuch as it is interwoven with the very life of india inasmuch as hinduism without caste is practically unthinkable i ask you i plead with you that you will not let prejudice stand in the way nor let tradition blind you to the necessity of the times discuss the question earnestly seriously without passion without antagonism and in your wisdom devise some remedy for the evils so that we may again feel with the great author of the system that it emanates from him then will the system flourish as it was intended to do and again the fourfold order may regenerate the future of india end of section seven read by sandra near montreal twenty twenty two